Hi, Robin here. Today we're going to be talking about polar bonds and dipole moments because these end up being very useful in how we look at how molecules stick together. So let's start off with a couple of review items. Let's talk about electronegativity. Remember that electronegativity is a periodic property where you have two nuclei sharing electrons as part of a bond and electronegativity tells you how hard each nucleus pulls on those electrons. So when we talk about tug of wars and we depict it, we're often looking at pictures like the one I've got on the screen where you have relatively equally matched contestants, but that's not always the case. You could have someone who works out versus uh, someone who doesn't work out and you know which one is probably gonna win. So the same is true with nuclei. They can pull on shared electrons with varying degrees of strength and that's what we call electronegativity. And what happens then when you have mismatched electronegativities when it comes to two atoms that share the same electrons? You end up with what we call a polar bond. So think back to what you just learned about atomic orbitals overlapping to become molecular orbitals. Let's say you have, for example, two nuclei with sp3 orbitals that are gonna overlap and you might get something that looks like this. Remember that any orbital, whether it's an atomic orbital or a molecular orbital, is a probability distribution. It gives you a probability of where that electrons are most likely to be. And the way I've depicted it in this particular cartoon, there's an equal probability distribution that the electrons are gonna be by either nucleus. But what if one of those nuclei has a higher electronegativity than the other one? then that one is going to pull on the electrons harder and your electron distribution probability is going to change. So you might have a higher probability closer to one nucleus than you would towards the other. And that's where we get what we call a polar bond, where you are more likely to find the electrons on one end of the bond than the other. And so if you'll remember, we denote that with this delta plus and delta minus symbol where the delta plus indicates a slightly more positive part of the bond and the delta minus indicates a slightly more negative part of the bond. So you're gonna hear two different terms. You're gonna hear the term dipole and you're going to hear the term dipole moment. So let's go ahead and distinguish between those two. A dipole is anything where you have a positive and a negative charge that are separated by a distance. Um, you can also have magnetic dipoles. We're not going to talk about those too much. But of course, with the electromagnetic force, you can have either an electric dipole or a magnetic dipole. For bonds, we're really worried about electric dipoles. So then what is a dipole moment? Okay, a dipole moment is looking at a dipole and actually putting a number on how strong that dipole is. So you will see some texts have the strength of the dipole moment in a unit called Debye's where they're actually measuring how strong that is. And it turns out that how strong a dipole is can be very important in terms of how molecules interact with each other. So up until now, we've been talking about dipoles in terms of a bond. And now what we're going to do is we're going to apply that to a whole molecule, which may or may not have just one bond. So we especially want to think about uh, multi-bond molecules. For any molecule to have a dipole, it's got to have two things going on for it. The first is it's got to have at least one polar bond. Now, as long as it has one, it may have a dipole. It can have any number that's one or greater. The other thing is it needs to have a distinctly positive end and a distinctly negative end. Let's look at a couple of examples to see what that means. And so basically what we're gonna look at here is we're gonna look at the difference between carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. If you look at the electronegativity difference between carbon and oxygen, there's a pretty large difference. Carbon has an electronegativity of, I think, 2.4. Forgot to bring my numbers here. Um, oxygen is 3.5. And so that's you know greater than one difference, which is definitely a polar bond. So we're going to see polar bonds in each of these molecules. 
let's start with carbon monoxide. That's the easy one because it just has one bond. And so we have our delta positive and being the carbon, the delta negative and being the oxygen for that bond. And so we can draw a dipole for this. If you remember that notation, we draw an arrow pointing towards the negative end with a little plus on the part that has the positive end. So that's where the dipole goes in this molecule. And it's easy to tell that this molecule has a dipole because the carbon is the distinctly positive end, the oxygen is the distinctly negative end. Now let's look at carbon dioxide. Again, we have the same electronegativity differences, but we have two bonds. And each bond has a positive end with carbon and a negative end with oxygen. So I've shown one, now let's show both. When you look at this molecule, which end is the negative end? Well, actually they're both negative ends, right? You can think of this in a couple of different ways. The most rigorous way is to think about these as vectors. And so if you've had enough math that you can do additive vectors, you can easily figure out that this has a net zero dipole moment. But even without the math, you can figure this out because you can see that electrons are pulled just as much to one side as the other. Therefore, we don't have one end with more electrons than the other. No positive end, no negative end. So really what it comes down to is symmetry is important. You think back to carbon monoxide, it's not symmetrical. And so you can end up with more electrons on one side than the other. If you think about carbon dioxide, it is symmetrical. The electrons are pulled equally in opposite directions. And so when we think about whether a molecule is polar or not, we're always gonna think about the symmetry. So let's talk about how to predict whether a molecule has a dipole. So if someone gives you a molecular formula and asks you to predict whether the molecule has a dipole, unless you're very familiar with the molecular geometry of that molecule, you need to start out by drawing an electron dot structure or what some people call a Lewis dot structure. You need to use that to determine the molecular geometry of that molecule because that's how we're gonna figure out what the symmetry is. Once you have the molecular geometry, you're gonna look back at that molecule, determine where you have polar bonds. Here it's gonna be really helpful to have access to an electronegativity chart. So I'm gonna drop a link to one of those down below. Once you've located the polar bonds, the next thing you're gonna do is look at the symmetry and determine whether a molecule has a negative and a positive end. Let's look at ammonia. Does ammonia have a dipole? Let's draw the electron dot structure. And I'm not gonna go through this in great detail because ammonia is one of the things that people love to trot out when we do electron dot structures. So hopefully you've done this before. Here's your electron dot structure. Um, what's the molecular geometry? If you count up, you'll see that this has four electron domains of which one is a non-bonding domain. And so what we get is what we call the trigonal pyramidal. Do you remember this? Okay, here is our molecular geometry. What's next? Next, we're gonna locate any polar bonds. Well, let's look at hydrogen that has an electronegativity of 2.1. Nitrogen has an electronegativity of around three. And so, yeah, that's a polar bond. So we're gonna have polar bonds going like this, where the hydrogen is the positive end, the nitrogen is the negative end, and we're gonna have all of those set up like this. Now we need to look at symmetry to determine if the molecule has a negative and a positive end. Now, if you look at this from the top, what you'll see is a whole bunch of arrows all pointing in to the nitrogen. And so it looks from the top like you have no positive or negative end. They're all equally spaced, right? But from this angle, the way we're looking at it, you can see that even though a lot of those arrows are pointing towards the nitrogen. It's not just the, the inward thing that we're looking at. There's also an up and down component where all of these vectors have a slightly up component. So they're all pointing mostly in and a little up and there's nothing to cancel out the up. So we do have a negative end. It's up at the top by the nitrogen and the positive end is the end that has all of the hydrogens on it. 
Another way you can do that is to draw the dipole through like this. So now let's look at carbon tetrachloride and what we call chloroform. Trichloromethane is the systematic name for that. Let's start by drawing electron dot structures for each of these. Now they're very similar. Carbon is going to be the central atom for both of those. So carbon in the middle, in this case four chlorines. Draw one bond between carbon and each chlorine and then distribute the remaining uh, electrons. And this is what your electron dot structure looks like. Trichloromethane or chloroform. Again, carbon in the middle, three chlorines and a hydrogen around it. It's drawn one bond for each. Distribute the extra electrons. This is what that looks like. So now we have our electron dot structures and now let's look at the molecular geometries. Both of these have four electron domains. They're going to be tetrahedral. And so this is what it's going to look like. So now let's locate polar bonds. Carbon and chlorine, that's definitely a polar bond. The electronegativity difference is about 1.1, far above the threshold for polar. So each carbon-chlorine bond is going to be polar with a positive end down near the carbon, the, the negative end up near the chlorine. And so we can just go ahead and let's draw those in for all of the carbon chlorine bonds. And now let's think about carbon hydrogen bond. Is that polar? No. There's a slight electronegativity difference, but not enough that it's actually polar. Now let's look at symmetry. Are these symmetrical molecules? Well, let's look at carbon tetrachloride. Now, it's kind of hard to know without a whole bunch of angles and vector analysis how this is different. And so the easiest way to do this is really just to look at a model. You, what you'll notice is as you turn it, that it always looks the same as you turn it. So that's how you know that it has symmetry and you're not going to have any dipole in this molecule. That's not a polar molecule. So now let's look at trichloromethane. And what you'll notice is because of that hydrogen, we have that one hydrogen, this is not symmetrical. Yes, looking at it from the top, it does look like all of the arrows are pulling outwards in exactly the same way. But if you look at it from the side, you'll see that once again, we've got something up above charged things that are down. So what we're gonna get in the case of trichloromethane is we're gonna get a positive end um, near the carbon and the hydrogen and a negative end down by all the chlorines. And so what that's gonna look like is a dipole that goes this way. So this is analysis that requires a lot of practice and a lot of playing around with molecular geometry. I hope you have access to a molecular model set so you can build these things and look at them and look for symmetry. It's very important to identify whether a molecule has a dipole because as I said before, that determines how that molecule is gonna interact with the molecules around that. And that's what we're gonna talk about next. I hope this was helpful and I'll talk to you again soon.